On the morning of January 5th, 2016, officers from the Baltimore Police Department are dispatched to the Deluxe Plaza Motel. The murder scene was discovered by the maid while she was making her rounds. She immediately backed out of the room and called the manager, who called the police. When we get the call, it comes in as a, a questionable death, possibly an overdose, something like that. Detective McGrath went out to the crime scene with uh, Sergeant Lamar Howard at the time. And they went out and they assessed the crime scene and they realized, hey, this isn't a questionable death. There's, you know, there's clearly, you know, something has happened to this individual. He was fully clothed. You couldn't really see a lot at that point because we don't move him until the medical examiner gets there. There was some luggage and some strange things. You could see some what appeared to be uh, trauma to his face area. So we contacted Crime Lab to come out out of caution because we don't know what we had. We had them start to process the scene, photograph it, take fingerprints, recover evidence for any possible DNA. There is the body of a 255 pound man and he's from head to toe just beaten. He has bruising all over his arms, suggesting defensive wounds. His head, his face, his neck, his torso, just destroyed. It was a graphic, brutal, really gut-wrenching crime scene to look at. We were advised that he had checked in on the 3rd of January, so we knew he had been there a couple days. It's just totally in disarray. So the crime lab photographed everything took swabs of blood samples. We recovered the clothing for, for processing later on. There was women's clothing inside the motel room, which led us to believe that there was definitely a, a female there. There was cigarette ash on the body, suggesting that after he had died, somebody is sitting there smoking over his body and ashing on his body. That was a very disturbing fact. After an initial assessment of the crime scene, police focused on discovering the identity of the victim. Edward Yusaitis had used his ID and credit card when he had checked into the room. So we just started to uh, try to gather some information on where his family or who's next of kin might be. He was born in October 67. Now I'm in October 69. Growing up, heck, we were close. Pretty much did everything together. He was always there for me in high school. He was always helping me with my homework, I would say. I mean, he was very smart as far as that goes. Academically, he was pretty bright. Detectives analyzed the evidence collected at the scene and obtained a vital piece of information from the motel's surveillance footage. Detective Miller was able to watch three days of video. We see that there are two individuals leaving the motel room at 7.04 a.m., just four hours before the victim is discovered. Going back on the video, we can actually see that the victim arrives with two other individuals on January 3rd. They arrive, they go to the motel room, and then they don't leave the, the room for a day or so. We were able to contact Edward Yuseta Sr., advise him of his son's death. And during that conversation, he said he had gotten a call from his son, and it was from a strange number that he didn't recognize. And it, he was able to provide that number. And from that, we knew that that was the local number. We took that number, and we were able to check some databases. And based on that phone number, we found out that Christopher Wilkins had used that number to call 911 previously. And he had an, a girlfriend named Angel Fury. The 911 call, he says his girlfriend Angel was overdosing. And that was on December 30th of 2015, just what, five, six days before this incident happened. At that point, they become suspects because they are the last ones with the victim. We were able to track the suspects back to their origination in the train station on January 2nd. And they had approached the, the teller station to purchase tickets. In Baltimore, in every train station in the United States, you have to present an ID. And the two suspects presented their ID to purchase these train tickets. And that's one of the ways that we learned of the name Christopher Wilkins and Angel Fury. There was nothing glaring about their backgrounds that screamed cold-blooded killers. These were people who clearly had issues with drugs, probably spent most of their days walking the streets, moving from place to place. After obtaining the key suspect's background information and criminal history, police turned their attention to tracking down their current whereabouts. 
We pulled the surveillance video from the Deluxe Plaza Motel and we were able to see them leaving the room the morning of January 5th. About seven o'clock in the morning, they left the room. We combined that information with some of the information we learned about Edward's phone. His phone was used to purchase an Uber. And we learned that they had gone from the Deluxe Plaza Motel back to the train station. Then we pulled video surveillance from the train station and saw them entering into the train station uh, just before 10 o'clock in the morning. What was a little bit eerie about their arrival is they were wearing Edward's clothing. They had left behind their own personal belongings. They took his phone, they took his wallet, and they wore his clothes from the motel back to the train station. When they got to the train station, they already had their tickets purchased, one-way tickets to North Carolina. Because we knew where they were going, we knew that Wilkins had family in North Carolina, and we involved the assistance of U.S. Marshals. They were able to track Wilkins and Fury back to his father's house, and that's where they were apprehended. So you know why we're here? Okay. What happened? What? You said you know why we're here? I go through all the evidence we have and I list what I believe happened. She is saying, well, what's the difference if I tell you or not? Because, you know, I'm going away for life anyway. And Gary explains, well, there's first degree murder, there's second degree murder. How does this happen to his face? Did you with anything? Just as, just this? Did you hit him with your fist? Did you kick him? Did Chris? How do you know that he was alive when you guys left? He looked alive. What's looked alive? He was like moving and talking. It's it's an admission of guilt that they they know that hey what I've done was wrong and and. I'm going to jail forever because of, you know, we've, we've killed somebody. Something happened in Baltimore before we all came down. We just talked to Angel, um, and we didn't end up down here by accident. So we're down here just to get your side of what happened. So what happened? I'm on the 12th, but I'm, I don't want to get myself in trouble. I know what I did. Well, you're, you're under arrest right now, so the getting into trouble, that part's over. So what part of you bought train tickets? You met somebody, you need a room, that's the room, you go to stay at the room, man. Right? Or you got a little bit of high style, try to touch my wife. I went to style and he started bowing on me, slapping on me. We got into it. And we went from there. He was alive when I left. How do you know he's alive? He thought it was just living. He just told you to leave. Could you get your stuff in the other hand? I don't know if you put him in this way. We recovered Christopher's DNA in the interview room, and we recovered the shoes. Detective Niedermeyer walks Christopher out of that interview room into a holding cell, where he's waiting until uh, we transport him out, out of the, the um, homicide unit. Christopher asks, what am I being charged with? And Gary says, you're charged with first degree murder. And Christopher says, you know, I didn't, we didn't mean to kill that man. We drove him back to Maryland. Um, we arraigned them in front of a circuit court judge here in Baltimore City, and they were formally charged with first degree murder. We also charged the suspects with robbery. Now, in Maryland, if you end up causing someone's death during the commission of a felony, such as robbery, you are responsible for that death as if you had committed murder. As law enforcement prepare for the trial of the accused, Christopher Wilkins declares he would like to enter a plea deal. Mr. Wilkins decided to take a plea and plead guilty uh, to the murder of Edward Eusatis. And he was sentenced to life, suspending all but 30 years, meaning he serves 30 years in prison. Angel Fury did not agree to a plea. She insisted on going to trial. And her trial was in July of 2017 in uh, Baltimore City Circuit Court. She was convicted of the murder and a count of robbery. And so she was actually sentenced to life, suspending all but 50 years. She got 20 years more than Wilkins did.